Well, welcome back. I want to have you turn in your Bible, if you will, please, to the book of Genesis again, chapter 14. The blue-covered Bible in our uh, auditorium, it's page 11. But uh, Genesis chapter 14 is a wonderful event, really. It's a battle, but it ends good. It ends in victory. And I want to say this, that just because God promised Abram that land, that did not mean that there would be a total elimination of all opposition and all battles in that land. No, enemies would attack, as we see. Uh, Battles would be fought, but thankfully victories would be won as well. What we see happening in Genesis 14, I think, is simply the outworking of the promise that God gave to Abram in chapter 12, uh, the first three verses, where he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to make you great, and I am going to bless you, and I'm going to bless people that bless you, I'm going to curse people that curse you. What happens in chapter 14 is an outworking of that promise that God made to Abram. Now, I want to shift gears real quickly here, and I want to share a couple of New Testament verses with you, and this is the connection to chapter 14. Romans says, Romans 15, 4, don't turn, listen. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience or endurance and comfort of Scripture might have hope. And then also the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. That is, all that happened to the children of Israel happened for examples They are written for our admonition, and admonition is a warning. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. When you put those two verses together, what you come up with is everything that is recorded in what we would call the Old Testament is meant to be for our learning, is meant to apply to us, is meant to teach us spiritual truth and lessons to live by. And so here's how I want to apply what's happening in Genesis 14 to us. Because I'm telling you, everything that happens to Abram, and everything that happens to Israel for that matter, impacts us. It affects us. It affects all of human history. It affects all of God's people in particular. And so I want to make some spiritual application this way. God has made tremendous promises, spiritual promises, to you and I. You're a believer in Jesus. You've been washed in the blood. You're a blood-bought child of God. You know Him as your personal Savior. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are yours in Christ. And the Bible tells us that everything that we need to live the Christian life here and now is available to us in Christ. And so we've been promised great spiritual blessing. And we've been provided wonderful provision. Tremendous what we have given us from the Lord. But I want to remind you, and I want to warn you as well, that we are up against spiritual opposition, spiritual enemies that are going to attack us all the time and seek to prevent us from enjoying and experiencing what Jesus calls life more abundantly. And so... As we go into the scripture this morning and we see the battle here, I want you to liken that to the spiritual battle that we are in the midst of as the people of God today. Let's pause a moment. We'll have a word of prayer. And then I want to continue to share some thoughts with you. Heavenly Father, 
So good to be here. So wonderful to have some gather together with us in person. And I pray for those that can't at this time that they would be just as much engaged and connected with the truth that is here in your word. Prevent the distractions, and I pray, Lord, that we'd be focused, and Spirit of God, that you and that still, small voice would just speak directly to the individual heart and to accomplish your will for your glory in lives. Thank you for Jesus and for all that he is and all that he has done and all that he means to his people. We're looking to him. We're dependent upon you, Holy Spirit of God. You are that promised power of Pentecost. And right now, I take you as my enablement and thank you that you undertake for me. And I pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, the first 12 verses of this 14th chapter of Genesis, really, I call it a raid. It's a raid. What you have happening is you have five nations on the plain of Jordan, down near the Dead Sea, and they are, they are nations that are subject to, to four other nations that are on the other side of the Jordan River. These five nations are on the west side of the Jordan River. The other four nations are on the east side of the Jordan River, and these five nations have been for 12 years subject to to those four kings, those four nations, on the east side of the Jordan. And what happens as you read these verses, not going to take the time to read them again, but what happens is simply this. After 12 years of being oppressed, those five city-states or nations, they're at the uh, bottom of the Dead Sea, on the west side of the Jordan River, they revolt. They revolt against the kings that are oppressing them. And as a result, those four kings send their armies in and invade, and they defeat the five kings, and they loot the place, and they take captives as well. That's all in the first four verses. Now I want to say this. Did you know that if you are a believer... Every single day that you live and all throughout the day and even when you're sleeping, there is a spiritual enemy that he is, the Bible describes him as like a roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for believers that are not vigilant, believers that are not awake. Believers that are not on the lookout, he's prowling around because he wants to devour you. He's a real enemy. He's on a raid all the time. He wants to raid your life. He wants to raid this church and churches like this. He's an enemy. Just like these, five, these uh, four kings were an enemy of these five nations. I want you to also see something else. Think about this. Four invading nations against five nations. Now, wouldn't you think that five nations ought to be able to put down the invasion of four nations? Because more, greater, larger? You would think so. You would think that the five nations would have the advantage. But that's not the way it worked out. And I think one of the reasons for that is because the, the nations that were being, uh, first of all, oppressed, and then were being invaded by their oppressors, were nations that lived lifestyles in which they were totally unprepared for this kind of battle. They were not prepared for it. Look at verse 11. They took these invading kings, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the victuals or the food and went their way. So they were not prepared. Why weren't they prepared? Well, I think we might be able to get a little glimpse of their unpreparedness 
by listening to what the prophet Ezekiel says, how he describes Sodom. Here's what he says. Listen as I read. Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. It's, it's God through the prophet talking to Jerusalem and saying, you know what? You're just like Sodom. Here is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, affluence, abundance of idleness, leisure time, was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, selfishness, and they were haughty, prideful, arrogant, and committed abomination before me, involved in immorality. That's how God describes Sodom. Now to me, that explains a lot. To me, that shows that there was not preparation for this raid because they were too busy involved in their selfish lifestyle. They were too busy distracted by all these other things. And I think that we ought to recognize then the warning that we are given in the scripture that we're not to love the world. What Sodom is described as in Ezekiel is really they're fully worldly people. They're just all caught up in this life alone. And they're all about things. They're all about earthly things. That's what worldliness is. That's a worldly attitude. To simply be focused on the here and now, to simply be focused on this earth and the things of it, the things that pertain to this life alone. We are warned in the scripture, love not the world. Don't love what this world loves. Don't love the things of this world. Don't be engrossed in materialism. Don't uh, be simply living for this life only. Love not the world, nor the things that are in this world. It says, for uh, the, if you love the world, the love of the Father isn't in you. So we're not to love the world. If you are in love with this world, you like this Sodom, Gomorrah, those five city-states, those nations, you're not ready for the raid of the one that's on the prowl. You're not ready for Satan and other spiritual enemies that are always on the offensive and, and looking to attack. These people, when the raid came... They lack preparation. Don't you, don't you be caught up in the world that you lack the preparation that is necessary to stand up against your spiritual enemies. But here's another thing. What happens also is that Lot and his wife and his family and his things are taken. He's take, they're taken captive Lot is, uh, is impacted, I think, by the time that he spent with his uncle Abram and his aunt uh, Sarai down in Egypt. Remember, Abram took the family down there really disobediently. He, he panicked because of, of bad circumstances, and he took them down to Egypt, and uh, it was a mess. And I think that when they were in Egypt, I believe that, that Lot... Uh, Lot looked and he was moved by what he saw in Egypt and you find that when he makes his choice, when Abram gives him his choice, he chooses the, the best looking land. He chooses land that probably looked like uh, the area in Egypt where they lived, very fertile. He chooses, and the Bible says in chapter 13, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. But what you find here in chapter 14 is he's not near Sodom, he's actually living in Sodom. And when we're going to get to chapter 19, when Sodom is destroyed by God in judgment from fire and brimstone, he's not only living in Sodom, he's part of the city council. So here we are. I believe the fact that Lot 
the city that he had moved into. It's a picture, really, of what we're warned about in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That's exactly what this man Lot did. Progressively, he got closer and closer until he was a part of Sodom. And I think the fact that he is captured and his goods are taken away with him by the enemy is just an example of the fact that if God loves you, he's going to correct you. I see there's no preparation for the, for the raid, and then I see there's correction that comes as a result of it. The captivity of Lot and, the, and his family and the things that were taken from him was, I believe, God's correction. Did you know the Bible says that we should never look down on and despise God's correction in our life? That God uses circumstances and he uses people to chasten his children, to child train us. You can find it spelled out in Hebrews 5, uh, Hebrews 12 rather, verses 5 through 11 in particular. But if God loves you, if you're his child, God loves you and he is going to spank his children. This is Father's Day. One of the worst jobs a father has is to spank his kids. But I'm telling you, if you don't spank your kids, your kids are going to grow up and they're going to, they're going to do you such harm. They're going to hurt your heart so deeply if you refuse to discipline your children. God loves his children too much to just let them have their way. He disciplines them. And you know what? I might be speaking to someone this morning, and you know you're under the disciplined hand of God right now. He loves you. He's correcting you. And what your circumstances are and what's going on in your life may very well be, I'm not sure, but may, may very well be God's loving correction in your life. There's a raid. But it doesn't end there. There is also a rescue. I want you to, to go down with me, if you will, to the 13th verse. It, as a result of Lot and uh, his family and goods being taken, verse 13 says that Abram got word of it. Abram got word of it. it notice, one came that had escaped and told Abram, notice how, how he's termed there, he's called Abram the Hebrew. That's the first and only time in the Bible that you'll see that designation for Abram. He's called Abram the Hebrew. Why is he called that? Well, the word Hebrew uh, probably derives from his ancestor Eber, and it, it, uh, the word Hebrew means across the river, referring to the Euphrates River. Remember, that's where he came from. He came from Ur of the Chaldees on uh, the other side of the Euphrates River. And so, but they come to him, and what you see here in the 13th verse is just amazing because it really identifies Abram as a, a sheik or a sheik. Both pronunciations are possible. It identifies him as an ancient uh, sheik. And these other men in verse 13 he has entered into a covenant with, a treaty with, and uh, so the word comes to them, uh, comes to Abram, and he is now ready to risk his life in order to bring Lot and his family and his goods back and recover them. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but I'm telling you, what Abram's doing what Abram decides to do in rescuing Lot is right in line with Father's Day. Because 
one of the most important uh, motifs in the Old Testament is the father and his responsibility. The father of the house, he was responsible for the whole household, including the extended family, and not just the immediate family. And if any single member of that father's household was in danger, or was destitute, or was in any way disenfranchised, it was the responsibility of that father, the head of the house, to pull them out, to help them, to rescue them. And that's exactly the position that Abram's taken here in this passage. He's simply doing what in the ancient Near East was the thing that's done. That's the way it, it worked. But I want to say to you fathers that are here this morning, or that are listening in this morning, I want to say to you, God has put you in a very significant position. And there is more responsibility on you as a father than on any other person in the family. And if you don't take it seriously, when you give an account before God, which you will one day, you're going to do it with sorrow. This is a serious matter. Fathers are responsible for their households. You're responsible for the way your wife looks and dresses. You're responsible for the way your children look and dress. You're responsible for the, the things that come into your home that are put before people's eyes and put before people's ears. It's your responsibility. If you don't filter that, you, have, you are failing in your leadership as a father, as a husband. That's what we see here. This man takes it very seriously, and they did. They did in that culture, and we need to take it seriously as well. And so what he does is he treats Lot in an unselfish, unembittered way, shows him merciful and gracious, caring, brotherly love. You remember, Lot did him wrong, really. Lot did him wrong. Lot took advantage of his uncle Abram. He grabbed when Abram was giving. He grabbed. It's like, you know, someone saying, hey, I want, I want to take you out to lunch, and, you know, you get the most expensive thing on the menu. You might think that's fine to do. That's not, that's not right. That's a wrong attitude. That's what Lot did. Abram said, here, choose. I'll give you first choice. So he chose the biggest and the best for himself. And so... But Abram, look at him. Look at the graciousness of Abram. He says, it doesn't matter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the role that God's given me, and I am going to love this man. I'm going to rescue him, regardless of how he has treated me. You know, there is an interesting and I think very significant verse along these lines in the, the book of 1 John and uh, chapter 3, and verses 16 and 17 and it, it's, talk about, it's talking about our love for our brothers in the Lord. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. As a result, we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Have you ever considered your love for your brothers and sisters in the congregation here to that degree? Have you ever brought it to that level that you'd be willing to die for them? That's what the Bible says brotherly love really is about. Verse 17 says, Whoso hath the world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his heart, uh, his bowels of compassion, of mercy from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In other words, if your brother has a need, and you have the ability to step in and help, then by all means, you have a God-given responsibility to do so, and that denotes real brotherly love. That's what Abram does. What he does is he, he summons an army. He musters an army. And really, uh, essentially, Abram becomes the general, and he forms a coalition with these other local uh, sheiks, uh, as verse 13 says. Uh, brings to our attention and verse 14 he forms a coalition with them and he also arms 318 verse uh, 14 
318 of his own servants. Now, he arms them. I think they're his personal guards, and he makes them into his own personal militia. For him to have 318 servants trained as armed men means this man probably had a thousand servants. This guy was the CEO of a large corporation. It was an agricultural corporation. You know, there's a large farm down the road from where my mother lives in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County. And uh, my wife grew up on a dairy farm. Her dad had a large, pretty large farm uh, for, uh, back in the day. You know, they milked 200 cows every day. I bet that farm there down the road from my uh, mom's, they might have 800 cows. It's a big operation. Uh, there's uh, double wide trailers, you know, right next to that, the property. And I, I assume, I don't know for sure, that might be hired men that they have. They might have uh, half a dozen, you know, full-time hired men for that. To, here's a man that has thousand, over a thousand servants. He's, he's a He's a wealthy man. 318 of them he forms into a militia. He, he's trained them for, to be uh, guards, to protect uh, the things that uh, God has blessed him with. And he takes these guards, forms them into a militia, and he unites with these other sheiks and uh, their men, their army. Uh, and as the general, he, uh, he takes them into battle. The Bible says, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. If you are a child of God, you're already born into victory. You're already on the victory side. And if you are a child of God, there is no doubt about it, you can have victory over the world. You don't have to be eaten up by the world and the things that it has to offer. And we are told in the scripture as well that as believers, we can be equipped. We can be equipped with all the armor of God, the power of God in our spiritual. We can have spiritual armor to equip us in this spiritual battle that we're in the midst of. And the weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not fleshly. They're not worldly. They're not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the actual demolishing and pulling down of worldly and even demonic strongholds. That's the army that we're a part of if we're children of God. So he gets an army together, and uh, I want you to see the strategy in verse 15. He arms these uh, 300 uh, servants uh, and uh, they, they uh, have this confederacy going with these other sheiks and their army. And it says in verse 14, they pursue them unto Dan. That's about 130 miles from where Abram was located. So here's this, this group, this army moving 130 miles uh, uh, in, a, in a northeastern uh, uh, direction. And it says in verse 15, he divided him, look at the strategy here, he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So here's the strategy, and I believe his strategy is given to him by God. It's a God-given strategy, and he personally, he's a part of the army himself, he personally pursues the enemy 130 miles, and then when he gets there, he divides his forces and he leads a nighttime surprise attack and he gets them, catches them off guard. They're probably having a party with all that they had uh, taken. He catches them, off, he, he, he gets them, but some escape and so he continues to pursue them really about a hundred more miles and then brings about a total victory. Notice what happens. It says in verse 16, he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot, his nephew, his goods 
and the women also, and the people. Did you know that our strategy comes from God too? And the strategy that God gives us is that he provides us with all that pertains to life and godliness. And he enables us by his divine power, by the divine nature that we are the partakers of, to escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. By the Christ that lives in the believer, we are able to conquer. In fact, the scripture tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we have a victory too, just like he had a total victory. We are, he freed all the captives, he recovered all the looted goods, and Abraham enjoys a total victory with the armies that he is in a coalition with. And really, that's the fulfillment of what God said. I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to curse him that curseth you. And that, that's God's blessing. God's giving him that success. And Melchizedek really, uh, he, he nails it when he says in verse 20 uh, that God delivered thine enemies into thy hand. This is God's strategy, so this is God's victory. And uh, God's given you success. You know, Paul was a very discouraged believer at one point in his Christian life that he lets us in on. I'm sure there are more. But one particular point in Romans 7, he says, I am such a miserable, wretched man because I know what it means to be holy. I want to be holy. But it's like the more I try, the more I fail. Miserable man that I am, who shall deliver me? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory. And so the victory, folks, is not about you or I trying harder, uh, making ourselves stronger, but the victory is all about our trust in, our dependency upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in us to enable us to have victory over our spiritual enemy. The world is what is in pictured here. And then the end of the chapter, it goes from raid to rescue to what I call reward. And so look at verse 17 and uh, following, because here he meets two kings. He meets Melchizedek, and he meets this other king of Sodom. What's his name? Mira, I think his name is. You know, he doesn't know it. Abram doesn't know it. But he's, he's facing another battle. It's a personal battle when he meets these two kings. And often, some of our greatest battles are after we've enjoyed a victory. A battle of a different kind here. He's met by these two different kings. Bera, the king of Sodom, Melchizedek, the king of, uh, of Salem. I think that these kings, these two kings, represent two things by what they offer. Bera, the king of Sodom, he offers to Abram all the spoils in exchange for the people. You remember seeing that? Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the, the persons and take the goods to thyself. Melchizedek, his offer is he comes with rations. He comes with bread and wine for Abram and the troops. He comes to refresh them. So, two different offerings. One, Melchizedek is offering the blessing of God upon Abram. And Sodom is offering the bribery of the world. We always have that choice. Either we choose the bribery of the world or the blessing of God. Which one do you want? That's the choice we're always making. Either we are giving or we're grabbing. I don't know which choice identifies you. 
You want the bribery of the world or you want the blessing of God? The first uh, person he meets up with is this king Melchizedek. It begins in verse 18, if you'll look there with me a moment. Melchizedek, king of Salem. Salem means peace. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Salem is a, 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 uh, a former name of Jerusalem. Okay? And so it's Jerusalem, Salem. He's Melchizedek, the, the king of Salem. He brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, that is, Melchizedek blessed Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. What a description for God, right? The Most High God, El Elyon. The Most High God, he is the possessor of heaven and earth. And uh, verse 20, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And what did Abram do? He took a tithe or a tenth of all the goods that he had recovered, and he gave it as an offering to the Most High God through this priest, this king priest, Melchizedek. Now, I want to say something to you. Melchizedek represents giving. King of Sodom represents grabbing. Melchizedek represents giving. I don't want you to forget the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And so then we are told that when we give, we are to give in proportion to what we have been given by him. And thus we are to give it liberally, generously, and we are to give it cheerfully, hilariously, joyfully, because it's his who's first given to us. Now this King Melchizedek is a representative of God. He's a king and he's a priest. You don't find that in, uh, in Judaism. You don't find a, a king that is also a priest. Two different uh, tribal uh, families. The kings came from Judah. The priests came from Levi, right? He is a king priest from the city of peace, Salem. He is identified as a worshiper and uh, a public follower of the Most High God, of Yahweh, of El Elyon. And he is a picture, the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 7, of Messiah's superior priesthood over the priesthood of Aaron. Melchizedek is a picture of a superior priesthood. I don't have time to go to Hebrews chapter 7, but you can look up that message because we preached through Hebrews last year. Look up Hebrews chapter 7 and you're going to find that Jesus, the Messiah, is a priest after the order of, not Aaron, but of Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek is a representative of God, and he is a type of Jesus the Messiah. And he brings his bread and wine as rations, as food for the troops. And it reminds me of the wonderful provision that we have every day from God's hand for our spiritual good and nourishment. And the reward, the best offer of these two kings is the offer of Melchizedek. The best offer is he offers to Abram not all the goods that he had won in battle, but the blessing of the Most High God, the blessing of Yahweh, the blessing of El Elyon. And Abram, of course, is so overwhelmed by that that he reciprocates with gratitude out of his heart uh, uh, for God's greatness and for God's goodness to him, and he gives that tithe through Melchizedek. The other king, this grabbing king, verse 17, the king of Sodom, he went out to meet him, and, uh, and then in verse 21, he says, look, let's make a deal. I'll trade you. 
You keep the goods, give me the people. Abraham basically says, no deal. I'm not doing it. I'm not in this for the goods that I can get out of it. You know, 1 Timothy 6 is a chapter that you ought to look at from time to time. It's, about, it's a warning about grabbing. It's a warning about wanting more. It's a warning about covetousness. It's a warning about going for money. It's a warning about all of that stuff. Because if you want riches, if you want to increase your wealth, if you want riches, if that's what you're living for, there's a warning. You're going you're gonna to drown you're going to drown yourself in sorrow and destruction. We should flee those things. 1 Timothy 6. I, I commend 1 Timothy 6 uh, to, your, to your reading and your meditation. It's, it's against continually grabbing for more. Not being content with what you have. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So he says, let's make a deal. You take the goods, I'll take the people. Abram says, no deal. I am not trading people for goods. I'm not going to do it. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't take it. He rejects the offer. Because maybe Abram's thinking, you know what? If I give the people to that king, he's just going to take them and, and put them under his tyrannical rule and uh, bring them down the road to hell. Whereas if they have a choice and they want to come with me, I can show them who the true and living God is. So I'm not giving these people to you. Sad news is, as far as we know, no one followed Abram. Not even Lot, his own nephew. He went back to Sodom with the king. God owns you. He's your king. He's rightfully the king of all humanity because he's the creator. But if you're a believer, he certainly is your king. He bought you. The king bought you with his own life. The king says your, your life your body and the life in it belongs to me. I've purchased it for myself. Therefore, I want you to do something voluntarily. I want you to voluntarily present your body to me. I'm not going to take it. I want you to do it voluntarily based upon your appreciation, your gratitude, like Abram giving that tithe. I want you to present your whole self to me as an appreciation for what I've done for you. It's a real temptation. This offer that this wicked king gives to Abraham is a real temptation. It's a compromise. It's a temptation to compromise for gain. It's an appeal to Abram's flesh uh, to, to bow to this wicked king. Lot had already done so. And you know, that didn't turn out too well. You know, there are things that perhaps are legally right for believers that are not spiritually right for believers to do? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, all things, all things are legal for me, but not all things are expedient for me, and I refuse to be brought under the control of anything. Just because it's your legal right doesn't mean it's the will of God for you. Same chapter, he talks about, he was talking about, you may have the legal right to take a brother or sister to a court of law. But don't do it, because it's going to bring deep damage to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So instead, suffer the loss. That's the will of God in the matter. That's a real temptation that he has here. It's really a test. Abram, who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust in this world and what it has to offer you? Or are you going to trust, are you going to depend on God? What is your dependence in? What is your dependence upon? 
And then, of course, in verse 22 to 24, he turns it down solidly. Abram says to the king of Sodom, Look, I've already lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He used the same language Melchizedek did. He and I, we worship the same true and living God, the one and only God, the possessor of... Look, I worship the, he the God that possesses heaven and earth. What do I care about some goods that you're, you want to trade me for? I was young, now I am old. Yet have I never seen God's people forsaken and begging bread, the psalmist says. You have nothing to lose in turning down the compromises of the world for worldly gain. Basically, Abram says, look, leave me out of this deal. I'm not in it for the money. I, I, that's not where I'm at. I'm, I, I, greed is not, uh, uh, is not the thing that I'm tempted by. And I'm never, what he says here in verse 22 is classic. I will take a string to a, a leather shoelace from your sandal or anything that's yours. I'm not going to have you then turn around and say, see how wealthy Abram is? Guess what? I gave him that wealth. No. What I have is the blessing of God and it has nothing to do with you enriching me. So he turns it down flat out. He says, I'm not going to be indebted to this wicked world. Not a single string. Only God's blessing is what I want. All that we could get a hold of that. That we would not uh, want the silver and gold of this world. That we would be content with Christ. Hebrews 13.5 In closing, I want to say this. I don't know if you've noticed it, but there's a pattern here. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast out of the garden, and God put a cherubim, angel with a flaming sword, on the east side of the garden to keep them out. In other words, Adam went east. When Cain killed his brother, he was banished. The Bible says that he went east. In chapter 11, when the Tower of Babel is being built. They were people that have gathered and went east. In chapter 12, when God calls Abram to leave the east and to go west, he's the first person in the Bible to go west. Not that that direction has uh, any, any merit to it, but the point is this. Are you willing as a believer, to live a lifestyle that is in direct opposition to the rest of the world? Are you willing to go west, so to speak, when all the world's going east? Are you willing to be different? Are you willing to do what God's called you to do, no matter what anyone says or thinks or does? Will you trust God and follow Him and go in the opposite direction of the world? You know, I heard a, of a true story that took place during World War II among the Allies when the Allies were going to invade Italy and drive the Germans out. They would come from the south, and they were going to come through Sicily. But the Germans got word of it, and so they built up huge defenses and bunk, uh, bunkers and, and dug in on the island of Sicily. And there was a British intelligence officer that came up with a plan. He said, if we could deceive the Germans into thinking that instead of coming up through Sicily, we would be coming up through the island of Sardinia and Greece. We could, we could do it. And we could push up through southern Europe. And so this 
intelligence officer for Britain came up with an, uh, uh, an amazing plan. And his plan was, let's find a fresh corpse from a hospital. Let's dress him in a, in a British uh, captain's uniform. Give him fake ID. Put in his, uh, put in his pocket uh, personal items. A license. A... Uh, uh, some romantic letters, perhaps a, a, a receipt uh, for an engagement ring, but also intelligence letters, intelligence letters from one British general to another general about uh, coming up through Sicily. But let's also, let's trick them and say, instead of Sicily, we will come up through Sardinia and Greece. And he said, and on the bottom of the letter, put a P.S. When this is over, let's have sardines together. They, they took this corpse. They found a corpse that, uh, that uh, had fluid in his lungs so that if an autopsy was done, it, it, uh, it would look as if he really drowned. They put that corpse, they took it in a sub, and they dumped that corpse in this officer's uniform with all of these fake papers in it off the coast of Spain. Some Spanish fishermen found it the next morning. They brought it. Spanish officials let the German intelligence know about it. German intelligence uh, read and, uh, and uh, unencrypted the letter and they were completely fooled by it. And they began to move their army over to the island of Sardinia and over to Greece. And they left little defenses on Sicily. And so General Eisenhower and, uh, and the, the British general moved their troops through Sicily with little resistance and on up and, and freed Italy and so forth. When I read that, I thought about us. I think the difference between defeat and victory in our spiritual battle in the Christian life is to never fight the wrong battle. It's not an earthly battle, it's not a physical battle, it's not an external battle. It's a heavenly battle. It is a spiritual battle. It is an inward battle that we fight. And you have to learn to depend upon God in order to empower you for victory. If we're fighting people all the time, we've missed the boat. If we get ensnared and caught up in all of this chaos that's going on in our country and, and, and pit ourselves as one group against another group, we've missed the boat. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities and powers that are coordinating all of this chaos on this earth. And we need to pray against them, and we need to prepare ourselves against all of that, and, and realize that our greatest enemy really isn't outside of us, but inside of us. It's our sinful flesh that gets enmeshed and all of that garbage, and we have hate, and we have bitterness, and we have revenge in our heart. And we're fighting on the wrong front. And we've been fooled by the devil to move our troops to the physical and to the outward and external when the battle is a spiritual heavenly battle inside an inward battle. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you might use the truths of this battle in Abram's experience to really teach us spiritual truth. Oh Lord, quiet our hearts before you. Let us sit down long enough to be quiet and hear that still small voice. Perhaps we've been talking too much. Perhaps we've been, we've been uh, shouting too much. And we need to just sit down as, as your people. We need to listen 
so that we wouldn't miss the still small voice because your sheep know your voice. And Lord, we hear you. And we heard you this morning. Whatever you've been saying to us from this passage, we hear you. Oh, Lord, may we heed it. May we hear it and do it. As was stressed this morning in the Torah time, may we listen, may we hear, may we do, may we obey, that it might, it might result in a holy life and in victory over our spiritual enemies that are already defeated, that we've been so fooled by. We've been sucked into uh, wrong battles. Lord, forgive us. Open our understanding. Take the scales from our eyes. Draw us to yourself. And anyone that doesn't know you as their Savior, may they understand they're lost and on their way to hell, and that Jesus already paid the full price of their sin, and they can be forgiven by trusting him as their Savior. May that be the case today.